right. Unit two is all about networks of exchange, particularly trade routes that we talked about before. Today we're going to start with the Silk Road. Well, at the end of the day, you should be able to explain the causes and effects and growth of networks of exchange, particularly the Silk Road. All right. Something that is consistently true in these trade networks, not only are goods exchange, but ideas, innovations, languages, religions are also exchanged. So in these trade networks, not only do they facilitate exchanges of goods and services and products, they also facilitate exchanges of ideas, religion, beliefs. And the Silk Road will not be an exception to that, or Silk Roads. The Silk Roads are a network of roads and trails that connect the east and west together. Unlike the other trade networks that we're going to talk about later on, the Silk Road is primarily based on land. And if you look at all the regions of the world connected by the Silk Road, it's very encompassing. It's very expansive. All the way here in the east, you've got China. you got India right there. You got Central Asia. You got Central Asia. You got India. You got Persia, Arabia, also known as the Middle East, right here. And then all the way westward, you get Europe connecting different continents together, particularly Eurasia or Europe and Asia together. This is one of the oldest trade networks in the world. The Silk Roads are thousands and thousands of years old. However, Oh, by the way, those of you that read, what kind of goods are primarily exchanged in the Silk Road? So, for so what kind of goods are those? Luxury, very good. So, most of the products exchanged in the Silk Road are luxury goods, such as porcelain, silk, gold, ivory, spices. Because trading by land is very difficult to do. Animals like camels and horses can only carry so much. Not all goods are going to be profitable. Those that are, are very expensive are going to be profitable. Oh, by the way, Unit 2 also covers the same time as Unit 1, so from 1200 to 1450 is what we're talking about today. Before 1200, the Silk Road, or the Silk Roads, were in decline. There was a decrease of economic activity in the Silk Roads. It's no longer as useful as it used to be. And then suddenly, we get to our class until 1200, suddenly the economic activity in the Silk Roads began to increase. So economic activity in the Silk Road began to increase during the period of 1200 and 1450. Trade expanded in the Silk Roads. And this is because of many factors that hopefully most of you read yesterday all converging together, promoting trade along the Silk Road. So today, you got two goals. Number one, you need to explain what caused this increase in economic activity, an increase in trade along the Silk Road. Number two, what became the result of that increase in trade or economic activity along the Silk Road? So, let's talk about the causes of the increase in economic activity. Why did the Silk Road Revived. Why did it become popular again? Number one, there was an increase in demand for goods. An increase in demand. More and more people wanted each other's stuff. The East wanted the West's stuff. The West wanted the East's stuff. This is primarily triggered by the Crusades. We talked about the Crusades in this class before. The Pope, the Roman Catholic Church, ordered or commanded Christians in Western Europe to go invade the Middle East. It's like a religious war, a holy war, to take back the Holy Land. I told you the Crusades were not very successful. The Christians are going to lose most of the encounters that they had with the Muslims um, during the Crusade. But when those Christians come back home, mm -hmm. what did they get a taste of in the East? They got a taste of some of these products. Products from the Middle East, products from India, products from China and they're gonna bring those home. That will increase the demand for goods, especially in Europe. They want more of that Chinese stuff, they want more of that Indian stuff, they want more of the Middle Eastern products. 
Before, they didn't know about them because largely Europe was closed off from these trade networks, but the Crusades will open them up and that will increase demand. So even though the Crusades were largely unsuccessful in the goals that they were trying to accomplish, when those Christians come back home to Europe, to France, to Germany, to England, when they come back, they will get, they will already have a taste of those products from the East. And that will increase demand. The Chinese are very much willing to sell because they're very much interested in European gold and European silver. So there's motivation from both sides. From the West, they want more products from the East. And from the East, they wanted money. So this caused that revive, uh, the, the revival of the Silk Road and the Silk Road being used more and more. Any questions about this? <coughs> They fought Muslims here in the Middle East, right? They were not successful for the most part, but in the Middle East, they found goods from the East. They found goods from the Middle East, from India, from Persia, from China, and they're gonna bring those goods back home, and that will increase the demand for more of those goods. Any questions about that? That's a good question. Next, let's talk about the Mongolian Empire or the Mongol Empire. We'll talk about them more in depth tomorrow. You're going to read about them tonight. The Mongols live in Central Asia, on the plains of Central Asia. And like most of the people in Central Asia, like the Turks that we talked about before, these people were nomadic. They would travel from place to place. Before, in the grand scheme of things, the Mongols were not very important until one Mongol was able to unify all the Mongolian tribes together into a formidable fighting force. His name is Genghis Khan. We'll talk about Genghis Khan tomorrow. And the Mongols will conquer most of the known world. Look at the Mongolian Empire. Look how big it is. They will conquer Song, China. They will conquer the Middle East. They will conquer parts of Europe. What can you tell me about the regions that are in the Mongolian Empire? That's where, that's where the Silk Road is, right? Along here, from China to the Middle East to Europe, that's the Silk Road. It will be controlled by the Mongols. Now, why is that a good thing? That's very good. This is a good thing because before the Mongols, all of these places are controlled by different states, and those states are usually at war with one another. So, using the Silk Roads, were not very, it wasn't very safe. There was not a lot of stability along the Silk Roads before the Mongols. When the Mongols unified all of this, they also stabilized the Silk Roads. There's not a lot of wars because everybody's controlled by the Mongols. And the Mongols protected those roads, they protected those paths and trails. So the Mongols will introduce stability along the Silk Roads. There's not going to be a lot of danger like it used to be. It made traveling safer and it reduced the risk. Part of the reason why the Silk Roads became unused for a long time was because it was very risky to travel all the Mongols will reduce that risk because they will stabilize the region. Any questions, guys? There's not going to be a lot of wars happening because everybody's controlled by the Mongols. Everybody's been conquered by the Mongols. All right, another reason for increase in trade and economic activity along the Silk Road is the more frequent use of paper money. In China, they called it flying money. So what you can do in China is you can deposit your deposit your valuables in one place, like your gold and the goods that you have, you can deposit it in one place. And then they'll give you a note, a paper note. These valuables are worth this much money. Then you travel along the Silk Road, and when you're ready to 
get your goods back or your wealth back, you just turn in the paper money. So this is called flying money. It's where our money comes from. It's where banking comes from. In Europe, they called it something different. They called it bills of exchange, but they pretty much acted the same way. You can deposit your valuables in one place and then get it back in another, making trade a lot easier because back then, gold and coins, these are heavy objects. And if you bring a lot of it, you're going to be targets of bandits. You're going to be targets of robbers that want to rob you. Paper money made everything easier, made transactions easier, and they made them a lot safer also, reducing that risk. Next, the establishment of caravanserais. Who can tell me what these are from what you read? The rest stops around um, along the Silk Road. Modern day equivalent would be like hotels and gas stations, for example, where you can take a rest rest stops that some of your families may have stopped by. So these are inns along the Silk Road where merchants can stop, resupply, get some food, stay in for the night, so they don't have to be exposed in the elements outside for the night. It made the Silk Road a lot safer. And it made traveling a lot less risky. Because you have some place to stay for the night, you have some place to get some more water, get some more food, and resupply. Now, that's what the caravanserais are, superficially, right? There are places where you can stop, you can rest, it made traveling easier. Merchants stop by, but what did these caravanserais promote? Trade, trading of goods, stability. There's stability in the Silk Road now. Very good. You got exchanges of ideas that's happening in these caravanserais. As merchants stop by from all over the world, they talk to one another. They share ideas. They share religions to one another. They share technology with one another. So you get cultural exchange and you get cultural diffusion as well. Now, cultural exchange is the exchanging of cultures, cultural diffusion is the spread of cultures, but they're basically the same thing. Next, our saddles. Saddles make traveling a lot more comfortable. If you're gonna go a long distance, you wanna be comfortable. Before the use of saddles, merchants can only go so far before everything starts hurting. Saddles made the journey a lot easier. If you don't know what a saddle is, a lot of, a lot of the saddles that are used here are padded. So when you're riding your camel or you're riding your horse, things are a little bit more comfortable. But not only did they make it comfortable for the person, they make it comfortable for the human, saddles also made it comfortable for the animals. Before, animals like camels or horses can only carry so much, but with that added comfort, now you can increase your cargo. You can give them a heavier load. So all of this contributed to the Silk Road expanding. The Silk Road being used more and more. More economic activity happening in the Silk Road. But what would be the result of that? We get the rise of trading cities. These are cities along the Silk Road that increase in population and wealth because of an increase in activity along the Silk Road. As more and more people are making that journey along the Silk Road, these trading cities got bigger in population and they also got a lot wealthier because they're stopping points along the way. They're strategically placed along the Silk Road. If you wanna know why cities like McAllen and Brownsville, right, why we grew in population and in wealth, why? We're stopping point between what? Where are we? Texas. We're at the border, right? It was a stopping point between the United States and Mexico, right? And it's a strategic location. It's the same thing for these cities. I know in your book, they gave you two examples, but there are many of them. Not just Kashgar and Samarkand. There were many of these trading cities that grew got wealthier by the expansion of the Silk Road or increase in activity in the Silk Road. 
Let's talk about Kashgar over here. Kashgar is in western China. What would be western China today? As you can see, along the Silk Road, it's very strategically placed for two reasons. If you're traveling from China, before you get to Kashgar, there's a long stretch of dry land. After Kashgar, there, also, there is also a long stretch of dry land. So, if you're going from China to Europe, it's a hard journey before Kashgar, and you know after Kashgar, it's also going to be very difficult. So this, had, this became a stopping point, a hub for merchants to stay in, to resupply. Kashgar is also beautifully located because it's located along the river. What do rivers provide? Water. But what do they tell you rivers do? They make what good for better? Agriculture crops. Which means what, what, what's in Kashgar? For merchants, what's in Kashgar? So if you're a merchant, you stop at Kashgar, you know you're going to find water, and you know you're going to find food. So Markan is also very much the same thing. It's strategically placed, it's a place for people to come, merchants to stop, resupply. And just like the caravans drive that we talked about, these became places where merchants from all over the world interacted promoting what? culture, exchange of language, exchange of religion, exchange of ideas, exchange of innovation and technology. So these trading cities also promoted cultural exchange and cultural diffusion. That's a theme of our class today, right? Any questions, guys? In fact, in these uh, two cities, we find evidence of different religious buildings there's Hindu temples, and there's Buddhist temples, and there's Muslim mosques um, found in these cities. And there's some that, um, there's little tiny Christian churches here as well. It shows you, because they're such a hub of the Silk Roads, they became a place of uh, exchange. They became multicultural cities because of it. Any questions? We even found evidence of Islamic centers in both of these cities for learning. We talked about Islam being a religion that pushes for learning and knowledge. Well, we find Islamic learning centers in both of these cities as well. All right, let's move on. Another result of the increase in activity in the Silk Road is an increase in production. Your senior year, you'll take a class called Economics. And one of the first things that they teach you is the law of supply and demand which you probably already know. When demand goes up, what happens to supply? It also increases. When people want stuff, if more people want something, the supply of that something will also increase. So another result of increase in activity in the Silk Road is more production to meet that increase in demand. So artisans and craftsmen from India, from China, from the Middle East started ramping up production, doubling, tripling, sometimes even quadrupling what they used to produce. In China, this became con a condition that led to what they called proto-industrialization. In China, they started producing more goods than what their population can consume. So in Song, China, during this time, they started producing more goods than what the population can which means the leftover will be sold along the Silk Road. Proto, if you don't know, means early. Because it's not quite industrialization yet. We'll talk about that centuries later, where we have machines cranking out products. It's not there yet. But there, we see a dramatic increase in production during this time. Most of these goods are still being made by hand, but they just increase that production. All right, and then lastly, we get cultural diffusion. So along the trade routes, along these roads, along these trails and paths, we get culture being spread, such as ideas, languages, knowledge, technology. 
was the, what was the first one? Ideas. Then you get religion. Which two religions benefited the most from the Silk Road? Islam. Islam, very good, and Buddhism, very good. Islam will spread a lot in the Silk Road. Buddhism from India will spread to the east, towards China and towards Japan later on. That's how you get Buddhism transforming. Mahayana, Tibetan Buddhism transforming. Islam will be spread all over. but not quite in East Asia. Now, all that is good, but there is some downsides to a more interconnected world. There, it's also easier for diseases to spread. As these people travel, not only are they carrying goods and ideas, they're also carrying diseases, germs with them. And sometimes it's even worse because the place that you come from, the people might have built up immunity in the place that you come from, but the place that you're trading with, those people may not have immunity to those diseases, causing a lot more devastation. I'm not sure if this is on your book, but which notable disease was spread because of these trade networks? If you don't know the bubonic plague, it will end the lives of one third of Europe. And it wasn't from um, Europe, it was from somewhere else. I think it was from China. Any questions? All right, let's talk about your Fornell notes. A couple of things that I feel that I need to emphasize before you turn them in. Number one, make sure you write your name, date of period, on top. So I can give you credit for it. Do not forget that first thing that you write. Also, please tell me what you're turning in. Is this 2.1 notes? Is it 2.2 notes? So make sure you let me know about that. Then this is where most of your notes will go to. The details of your notes will go to. A lot of times drawing something to help you understand, that's a good idea to do. Um, making graphic organizers, stuff like that. What I want you to avoid, if this is gonna drive you crazy and it's not gonna help you at all, is while you're reading, writing down notes. That's just copying, you're not learning from that. The better idea is you take it in chunks. You read a paragraph or you read a section of your notes and then write your notes. Write what you understand, write what you feel are important. That's what you should be doing. Show me that you're understanding what you're reading. Now that can be through text, that can be through bullet points, that can be through a drawing or a graphic organizer. Just show me, demonstrate that you're learning your understanding. Now, not everything that you're gonna read is going to be important. It's not, there's a lot of fluff, there's a lot of detail. To help you focus, this is what I suggest, look at your course objective for that lesson, and that will help you guide, that will help guide you figuring out what's important and what's not really that important, okay? All right, something else? This last part right here with the summary, from now on, I will make this optional, right? Just continue your notes. I'll give you extra points if you do it, but that's what you should be doing all throughout anyway, while you're doing your paragraph or your sections, however you wanna break it down. Some of you don't have the attention span to read an entire section and then write notes. You probably should break it down into paragraphs. Some of you can. All right, what I'm looking for here, guys, is understanding completeness also. Make sure that there's evidence that you read the whole thing, that there's, there is notes for some parts of it and there's notes for the last part of it also, right? I was grading somebody right now and it's obvious that he only read the first paragraph because that's all his notes is about. Make sure you're not one of those. I'm also suggesting make, make this sustainable, right? Some of you right now, you're bringing me pages that are five, six pages long, right? For right now, that's okay, because you don't know what you're doing yet, right? But that's not sustainable. You're not going to do that for me every night. You have other classes that you need to study for. You have other classes that you need to work for, right? So what I'm looking for here is about one to two pages of notes. You can go more if you want to, but make sure that it's sustainable for you, because we're going to be doing this almost every single night, and I don't want you guys to get overwhelmed. That makes sense for everybody. A couple of things why these notes are a good idea. Number one, it will help you. It will 
get you the information that you need if you're reading correctly, if you're taking down notes correctly. There are some things that I'm not going to be able to cover in class that you need to be able to know. So this will hopefully fill in the gaps. And then in class, I'll just point out the things that I feel are important for your exams. Next, during your quizzes, you may use these. If you didn't turn anyone in, anything in, then you're not going to be able to use anything on your, on your quizzes. Next, those of you that care about your grades, these are, if you do them correctly, these are hundreds going into the grade book. If you're not doing as well as you want to do right now, this can help you a lot. It can give you a cushion so that you don't have to do as well on the quizzes. You don't have to do as well on, on the exams if you get the grade that you want. But hopefully, taking notes will help improve those grades anyway. Does that make sense for everybody? Now, it's a double-edged sword. It can all help you, but it can also hurt you. If you don't turn these in, these are going to be zeros in the grade book. Turn them in late, I count 10 points off, but it's better than a zero, and 90 is better than a zero, right? Um, also, this first exam, I gave you a curve. Instead of grading it out of 50, I graded it out of 45. I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be doing a little, a little curves um, because the AP exam, they also curve it. If you don't turn in everything to me by exam day, I'm not going to give you that curve. Whatever you get is whatever you get. Make sense for everybody. The curve that I give you for your exams, you can only get them if you turn in all of these notes. Okay? If you stay consistent, make sure you stay consistent. Again, part of that being consistent is making sure that it's doable. If you're turning in eight pages to me, that's not going to be doable every night. Well, maybe for some of you, but for most of you, that's not going to be doable. Any questions so far, guys? of advantages, very little downside, but make sure you're turning these in. If you don't, if you don't have the 2.1 right now, right, make sure that you do 2.1 and 2.2 tonight. I'll still accept them tomorrow. You got three days, but then I have to subtract points. After three days, it's a zero, guys. Alright, a uh, couple other things. On your exam, a lot of you did really well. Uh, if you pass, considering this is your first exam, you did pretty well. If you got an 80 or above, you did amazing. Okay? Some of you in this class did so well, right? That I put up here. These are the people that have the highest grades on that exam. Um, I can't tell you their grades, because that's confidential, but I can put them in order. And you have people in this class that are on this list. I'm going to tell you right now, when I was your age, I couldn't do what you, some of you did right now. And I passed the AP exam, so a lot of you here are on your way from getting that 3, 4, or 5 in May. If you're on this list, keep it up. If you're not on this list yet, we have many different opportunities that are coming up. It's not impossible to get to. Yes, ma'am? Um, if we haven't taken it, Today, hopefully, if you're ready, have school. If you're ready. Ready? Bring your passes. Anyone have any questions? Congratulations to you if you're on this list. If you're not, you, if you did an 80 or above, you did pretty, pretty well. Um, and you can get on this list later on. Any questions, guys? All right, I don't want you picking up your phones yet. Right? Use this time that we have extra to do your notes, either 2.1 or 2.2. Take out your Chromebooks. Thank you.